Okay, quarter three, I'm back. Um, we will be looking at four letters that can be clumped together under the heading Paul's prison letters. Question, how many of you have had a study on the letter of Philemon? <laughs> Yes, it doesn't last long, but the longer I've looked at it, the more I've come to be of the opinion that it is very valuable for us today. And the ladies prayer group will probably get a kind of a smile out of this because we had some, they didn't realize it at the time, but we had some, um, should we say, I don't like to use the word coincidal, but some overlap here with Sunday school. But first, because it is a short letter, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, Athia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. When you approach the book of Philemon, I'd like you to have in mind one question. How do we persuade someone to take an action that is godly and righteous, but goes completely against what the surrounding culture says is their natural right. I think this is a valuable question for us today. How do you persuade someone to act in obedience to the will of Christ instead of obedience to the cultural dictate to say, but I have a right to this. I have a right to that. I can do this. 
when Christ is saying, do something else. And this letter is a, a beautiful example of how that persuasion works. So who is involved, right? Short letter, author, Apostle Paul, he's in prison, likely in Rome. You have to think who Paul was, right? Former ultra legalist Pharisee, now currently a prisoner for Jesus. <laughs> And of course, we have companions listed. At the beginning, he mentions Timothy, our brothers, probably acting as what they call an amanuensis, his scribe, the person who writes for him. And at the end, we have Epaphras. If you look at Colossians 1, 7, you'll find out that Epaphras is chiefly responsible for founding the church where Philemon lives, which is in Colossae. We'll move on next week to the letter to the Colossians, which was sent probably around the same time they're thinking it was a bundle of letters sent by Paul with the same messenger to Philemon, to the church in Colossae, which meets in Philemon's home, and then another letter to the Laodicean church, which meets in a different home in a different town quite a long ways away. So Epaphras would be known to him, right? This would be the person who had taught them Mark, that troublesome cousin of Barnabas who bailed on them in the first journey out. And then when Barnabas wanted to try him again on the second journey, Paul's like, ah, no, bad idea. We can't trust him to stay the course. And yet, look here, he's in prison in Rome and who's with him? Mark. Demas. If, if Mark had been troublesome in the past. We know from other letters, Demas is going to be troublesome in the future because when we get to 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter, we find out what? That Demas abandoned him because of he, he just preferred the world. Aristarchus, this Macedonian from Thessalonica, you find out about him in Acts particularly Acts 27, where it says that when the ship is taking Paul to Rome, Aristarchus climbs on near his hometown and goes to Rome to prison with Paul as one of his sort of caretakers. And then of course, Luke, Luke, the beloved physician, Luke, the one who has at this point is probably already documenting the life of Christ for his gospel and then the start of the church. So here's where the letter's coming from, this little community of workers in Rome. Where's it going to? A man named Philemon. We know only what we can draw from the context of a letter, right? He owned at least one slave, so we know he must have been fairly well off. He hosted the church in his house, so he must have been quite well off if his house was big enough to host. So we have this rich householder who lives in Colossae. We know that somehow, possibly when Paul was in Ephesus, which isn't too far away, they crossed paths and Paul preached the gospel to him and Philemon believed. Hence how Paul can say, you owe me basically your whole soul because I'm the one who brought you to Christ. So that's the recipient, but there's an audience standing by. Do you notice? It wasn't just to Philemon, but to a woman named Aphia. They're thinking that's probably Philemon's wife. And there's another name that comes in here, Archippus. It's only mentioned twice, and that's here and at the end of Colossians. Some people think this is maybe Philemon's adult son, or else it's a teacher he's taken in as part of his household. People did that when they were well off. They would take in a philosopher or a teacher, and it was a thing of prestige in most cases, but in this case it was practical because the church met in his house, so why not have the preacher live with you? The other thing we do know about Archippus is the mention at the end of the letter to the church in Colossae, where Paul 
leaves a message. This is verse 7 of chapter 4 of Colossians. Say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Okay, doesn't really tell us a whole lot, but we do know he is in ministry. Why is the letter addressed to these two as well as to Philemon? Because what he has to say affects the whole household. And of course, the church in your house, which means (laughs) what you would think is a private matter is not so private. This is to be read to the church, too. And then there's another party involved. He's not the sender. He's not the recipient. He's not even really the audience. He's this sort of silent party off to the side. A man named Onesimus. Apparently, Onesimus is a very common slave name during the time. Why? Because it means useful. And what do we know about Onesimus? We know only what we read between the lines here, that he had been Philemon's household slave, and yet somehow had ended up in Rome with Paul without permission. Natural conclusion is that he ran away. And this mention in verse 18, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, suggests that he might have stolen something from his master to pay his way to run away to Rome. And this same Onesimus is now returning to his master. Now, slavery in the Roman Empire was rather different than what we think of slavery being from the Western Hemisphere of the United States and the Caribbean. This was not necessarily a matter of, you know, you were captured, taken from your home, and you were usually born a slave. I mean, you might have become a slave through debt, or uh, if you committed a crime, they would take away your freedom and you would become a slave. And Rome had a weird way of looking at it, right? If you think about U.S. history with slavery, The whole basis of that was a denial of their humanity. They are not actually people. Rome said, oh, yes, they're people, but they're also property. You're like, wait, how does that even work? And yet in that culture, it was almost unanimously accepted, this conflict between, is this a person or is this a piece of property? There were very few dissenting voices who were against slavery. And toward the later part of the Roman Empire, where we are right now, none of those voices were active anymore. It was universally accepted that if you were a slave, your master had absolute rights over you, life, death, and everything between them. So for a runaway slave, the worst You know, if you go for the extreme, like the master had a real grudge against you, you would be executed if you were caught. And there were people who made their living. Anytime you have fugitives, you will have people who make a living catching fugitives. And if you were caught, you could be killed and no one would say a word. If your master was more moderate, was in a good mood, was reading in one source is like yeah if he was in a good mood when you were caught the you know probably moderate punishment would be that you would have your forehead branded with either a letter f for fugitive because of course the latin word for fugitive as actually sounds a lot like fugitive um or cf which is an abbreviation of a latin phrase that says watch this one he might steal from you And you would spend the rest of your life with that on your forehead. And this man is going back, Onesimus, to the household that has the right to do this to him. So he has a letter and an escort. 
Tychicus. We don't hear about him in this letter. He's the one that's carrying all the letters for Paul. And Paul is interceding for him. Now you have to also remember, anyone caught harboring a fugitive slave was in for some serious punishment himself. So here's the situation. In light of that, look at what Paul says. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now he's beginning theologically. This is a normal sort of beginning for a letter asking for a favor or from a peer or possibly someone of slightly lower status of you, but you have to remember what you're dealing with here. <clears throat> Poor, imprisoned, ex-Pharisee, no power, no real rights, writing to a rich, Colossian landowner. Who's got the higher status? But in the letter, you can hear it in every line. The blessing comes from Paul to Philemon. He is taking the role of almost like a, an older brother, a father, a mentor. And he's genuinely thankful for this man. He has heard great things about what he has done for the church. The, that phrase, you know, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. That's not usually what you think of when you think of rich people, right? <laughs> Especially in this day where you gave only where it was merited and where you could expect a return. But you think about what the church was in these days, right? What did Paul say when he was writing to the Corinthian church? Not many of you were, and he goes to list all of these things that were considered worthy in the culture. But Christ, you know, God chose the lowly to shame the haughty, if you will. And so here we have a man who has been a convert for probably only a few years but is at the point where he he hosts the church at his house he refreshes their hearts he is participating he has been transformed and paul makes his case very gently with a little bit of humor but leaning heavily not on his authority Did you hear that although i'm bold enough in christ to command you i mean you read all his other letters he's never shy of commanding people to do what's right but he says in this case for love's sake i prefer to appeal to you to persuade you on behalf of my child so he calls Philemon things like beloved fellow worker, um, my brother, partner. And of course, that word partner, sneaking along in the Greek behind, is koinonion. Does that sound familiar to you? Huh. In its technical form, it talks about partners in a joint venture people who have invested in the same venture, expecting something out of it that they then share. But in the spiritual term sense, what do, what do you think that means? They are partners in the gospel. They are both invested in the same pursuit. And so even though he could be bold, even though 
He could command. He appeals. He does not take his authority as Philemon's spiritual father, really, as he could. But he talks about this child, right? So if he ran away, he was an adult, right? And we don't know how on earth living in hiding in Rome, he happened to cross Paul in prison. But Paul says that Onesimus became as a child to him in imprisonment, which means Onesimus has been transformed also. Do you hear that sentence? He talks about, well, you know, he, he was useless to you. But now he's useful. This is that little bit of humor because he's like, he used to be not Onesimus. He was useless. We'll, we'll, we'll just be blunt here. And it may be that he had run away because, you know, he was kind of lazy at his job and he didn't want to do it. So he saw his chance and he bolted. We don't know. But that little play on words, he's useful to me and to you. Now, if you look at a lot of his other letters that were written in prison, you'll notice that he was dependent. Paul was dependent on the help of the churches in order to survive, basically. And they would send messengers with money, with resources, He is suggesting that Onesimus could be very useful in that role. I mean, he's made the journey once, and he knows Paul's circumstances. He's worked with him for a little while. But he doesn't want to just assume, right? I would have been glad to keep him in order that he might serve me on your behalf as your agent. But the way it was at that point, he wasn't Philemon's agent. He was a fugitive. So he has to go back. So this request, it's bold, not in commanding, but in pleading. And not from authority, which we can see Paul had, but for love's sake. And he doesn't base it on the moral imperative, which exists, right? How many times in how many letters has he said there is neither slave nor free, Greek nor Jew, male nor female, all these kind of things. These are now done away with in Christ. So he could have said, you know, this is the right thing to do. You know, in Christ, that master and slave stand side by side with no difference between them. So you should, you should let him go. And there are a lot of people who are like, you know what? He didn't say that, so <laughs> he must have been in favor of slavery. And I'm like, have you read the letter? He's saying, I don't want to command you to do what's right. I want to trust you to do what's right because of love. And I don't know what they make, those people who take that view of this, what they make of verses 15 and 16, because, you know, it's like, maybe this is why he was parted from you for a little while. So you can have him back forever, no longer as a slave. Now, what do they think that phrase means? (laughs) But more than a slave, a beloved brother. You see, here's the thing. Two transformed lives can never go back to the old way of relating to each other. I mean, it's tricky enough when you have only one transformed life in a relationship. In his letters, you'll find Paul writing, you know, if you are the one, like say wives, if you 
convert and your husband hasn't, you can win him by your actions. Uh, slaves, if you convert and your master hasn't, you can win them by your actions. But here we have a situation where we have two transformed lives. And he's saying, all right, there's no barrier here. You have a new way of relating to each other here automatically. If I can just get you to see that. And you could tell that he loves Onesimus. He doesn't just call him, you know, my child. But he calls him my very heart. And of course, this is not the Greek cardio, right? No. This is one that is really hard to pronounce. Uh, it's one of those Greek words that has a bunch of consonants together, but it basically means my guts. My internal organs, my viscera. <laughs> you, you're taking away my insides by keeping him away. But I'm so determined to see the two of you reconciled. Not just reconciled, but brought into a new relationship that I am willing to scoop out my very guts to give them so that you can be brothers. And did you hear the confidence at the end? Confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. I kind of wondered while I was reading through this. When the door opened, and here's Tychicus, and there's Onesimus standing there. And everybody's like, you. How dare you? And Tychicus says, you first read this. <laughs> And as the letter is being read, here's Onesimus standing off to the side like, uh, is this going to work? Am I going to be in serious trouble here? After he finishes reading the letter, what do you think Philemon would say? Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. There is a happiness and yet an immense amount of pressure knowing great things are expected of you. Because on the one side, you're like, oh, wow, I'm so trusted. I, I, he thinks I'm capable of all of this sort of stuff. And then on the other hand, it's like, ah, uh, but what are people going to say? Because <laughs> remember, no dissenting voices against slavery. There was a situation that people like to cite where um, a wealthy man was murdered by one of his 400 slaves. And during the trial, it was determined, and no one argued against it, that all 400 should be executed as an example. Even the innocent ones. This is the kind of culture that Philemon is living in. So what happens if he does what Paul says? We can say his peers are going to be shocked, appalled, what kind of an example is this going to set for the rest of your household? Are well, you going to set them all free? Might as well, you know, for us, it would be like, well, okay, so no more electric appliances, uh, no more car, no, none of these labor-saving devices. You're just setting everything back by hundreds of years. And yet, here's Paul's voice saying, confident of your obedience. I write knowing that you will do even more than I say. And do we know what happened? Of course not. No one writes the end of the story for us, but the fact that this letter was preserved and the early church has a little sort of a postscript that it offers. 
there is a record of a letter sent by a man who's being taken to Rome as basically a martyr. It's a letter to the church in Ephesus. And it mentions their bishop, you know, their overseer, their leader, Onesimus. An old man, greatly respected, wise. Could it be the same man? It's possible. So, very probably, Philemon said, all right, whatever it costs, Paul trusts me. He expects a lot of me. Let's try this whole new relationship. It's a short letter, but when you think about it and you look at it in its context, it is remarkable. How do you persuade someone to do what their culture says is their total right not to do? Somebody could say, he's my property. I can do with him whatever I want. Culture would applaud. Paul saying, no, you are both Christ's property. And we'll see this in his letters to the Colossian church and to the Ephesian church, where he sets a portion of that in there saying, you know, masters, you have a master. So behave accordingly. And the reason why I wanted to do Philemon first is that when you read Colossians, after you've read Philemon, there's a point in there where you're like, I wonder if everybody who's listening to this being read out loud was like, well, look, there's Philemon and Onesimus sitting together like equals, like brothers. Maybe there's something to this. But anyway, that's Philemon. Think about this now in your own context. Do you know someone who needs to be persuaded to a transforming choice that the culture around them would absolutely speak against, would react violently against? How do you persuade them Nonetheless, to walk in the ways of Christ, as opposed to what culture says, is your right. Principles here, relationship, first and last, relationship. You're never going to persuade someone by trying to take an authority over them, and you know, honestly, most people these days don't recognize any authority. But relationship, where there is love, there is natural authority. Because it's not because I'm telling you what to do. It's not because I think I'm better than you. It's because I want what's best for you. And that can only be proven over time. Reminds me of a meme that I sent to my family. It was a, a cartoon of two lizards. One of them was um, obviously had just blown one of those party favors that makes a startling noise. And the other lizard was standing there and tail had fallen off, right? You know, that whole drops the tail when it's in danger. And the one that one says to the other, you know what doesn't grow back, Susan? Trust. Relationship is so hard to build, so easy to pull apart. But that's where persuasion comes from, where you care and they know it, you've proven it. I heard a story about a man once who was trying to witness to a homosexual couple and, and <laughs> what, you know what really persuaded them? They both got a nasty bout of food poisoning 
And he was there cleaning up their vomit. And they're like, oh, you must love us. <laughs> and nobody would do that unless they loved somebody. Or were getting paid. And you're not getting paid. The relationship between Paul and Philemon, it, it probably didn't get a lot of time to develop. You know how fast Paul moved, but when he was staying in Ephesus, he was somewhere in the neighborhood. And we think probably during those, what was it, three years, he met Philemon. And from then it, it could only be nurtured through letters. But think about the people around you and all the opportunities you have. There is a chance to build the relationship that will persuade people to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. For next week, I would like you to read Colossians chapter one, talking about how Christ is both sovereign and sufficient, which is an important thing to remember when you're trying to build relationships is that, you know, the only one who is enough is Jesus. This is especially encouraging for those of us who are kind of bad at relationships because it's like, oh, you want, well, what do you want me to do? But then Jesus says, just do what I do. I'm like, okay, we'll give it a shot. Anyway, so let's, let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for every part of your word preserved for us to teach us, to give tangible words to your spirit moving in us. And this letter that you've preserved for us between Paul and Philemon, it teaches us, Lord, and we give thanks for that, how to speak to people, how to make the most of every encounter. Lord, we ask that you would work in us that you would put action to what we've learned so that your kingdom might expand and be glorified as you are glorious, that we might walk worthy of carrying your name. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.